Agrora is primarily an oud focused company. Um, I've been doing oud and atars for the past uh, more than a decade now. And in fact, although I had paused atars since about 2016, in fact, prior to that, my atars were in fact even more popular than my ouds. Uh, 2016 is when I really started to focus a lot just on oud. And that's when I started hunting in the jungles by myself and doing hand dist uh, handmade distillations. Started doing that at home. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I actually rented out a facility full time. So again, as I said, you know, it's oud centric first and foremost. In fact, one of the things which a lot of people say is, you know, Taha, your, um, for instance, my Layali or my Jazab, for example, uh, which are very uh, rose, not rose dominant, but it's the key player beside oud. So what they say is that it, it smells like rose flavored oud. Um, and what I like to do is I like to focus on not just the quality of the ingredients, because that's one of the things I'm really proud of. My handmade oud oils, which serve as the base for all the atars and the perfumes as well now going forward. Uh, they are not only extremely high quality, but because I handpick the raw materials as well, I go for some very, very unique, rare, amazing batches with this, you know, just the, the most beautiful aroma. And one of the things which a lot of people are surprised by is the fact that these oud oils possess what I called a, uh, a mind buzz as well. And so beauty, quality, and that mind buzz. That's what I focus on. Why perfume sprays now? Okay, I'm gonna give you an example. So imagine if you get the highest quality uh, ingredients uh, and you give them to a child. And on the other hand, if you just take some mediocre ingredients and then you give them to a uh, to a five-star Michelin chef, right? Who's gonna do a better job? Of course, it's gonna be the five-star Michelin chef. And the child, even if you give it the, the best ingredients of the world, the most fragrant spices, the freshest uh, vegetables and whatnot, they're just not gonna do as good a job. So one of the things I've noticed uh, in general in the industry, and of course, you know, there's of course exceptions, but I'm just talking about what I've noticed in general is the fact that uh, you know, there are cases where you have amazing quality ingredients that are used in perfumes, but for some reason they just smell like a, a concoction, a confused medley of essential oils. Literally, that's what they smell like. And then there's others where um, you can really tell that uh, the perfumer did a great job putting that composition together. However, uh, now I myself, I focus only on uh, all natural aromatic ingredients. Um, I don't have anything against synthetics per se. Uh, it's just that I am allergic to quite a lot of them, so I avoid them. I avoid them altogether. But imagine, uh, imagine my shock when I went to, well, I'm not going to say any names, but I went to certain boutiques and I smelled some, some perfumes which were in the thousands. And lo and behold, uh, you know, I can smell you know, they're, they're reeking of uh, this infamous uh, tobacco accord and certain other accords, which are, you know, like $5 per, I don't know, like a very large quantity. Uh, having said that, though, you know, the, the end product did actually smell quite beautiful. So that's a dilemma. Uh, and in general, this is what I'm noticing in the market. It's, you know, either the ingredients are very, very high quality but the composition is just messed up. Or you see these beautiful compositions, but the ingredients are subpar. Now, I'll let you in on something. My real agenda is actually to get you hooked on oud, uh, and specifically agroora ouds, because you know, what I do is, uh, I mean, I, I can't say I'm the only person doing this. You can find high quality ouds from other suppliers as well. But because I'm completely, fully vertically integrated, meaning I do hunting, I do distilling, I'm the guy who 
makes the perfumes. I'm the guy who sends out the packages, replies to email. Basically, I just do everything A to Z. Um, and part of that process is actually going out and selecting the raw materials. And I think one of the things which a lot of people, um, especially in the Western Hemisphere, what they don't realize is ouds can be as different as uh, the different races of humans. So you see a, 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 um, an African versus uh, a Chinese person versus a, uh, a North European. You know, they all look different, but they're all humans. And it's kind of the same with wild oot oils as well. So what I like to do is I like to handpick very, very special batches. And so, like I said, my real agenda is to share these ouds with the world. And I think that my perfume compositions, uh, they will help to achieve this goal of mine. Uh, now, one of the things that some people who have already, you know, the people, so, there's some people who have already uh, gotten these sneak peeks. So they've tried these uh, perfumes that I've made for the first collection, and they are just shocked by the concentration uh, because, you know, I make it very, 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 very potent. Um, in fact, you know, if you spray it directly on your skin and if you sniff it after a split second, you're not even going to smell the alcohol there. So people are not only shocked by the concentration, but they love the smell. And again, remember my agenda, it's the, core, it's the oud that's at the core. This profound oud, which makes the whole thing work. That is what people are very, very impressed by, not just the, the dosage of the oud. I mean, I just use an insane amount of oud. It's not synthetic oud, which is what uh, the majority of perfumes contain. Or the ones that do contain oud, they're usually very low-grade plantation oud oils. So mine are uh, wild, they are very high-grade, and it's always the, the main ingredient, uh, dosage-wise. And, um, and what I like to do is not just have ingredients that are very high quality, but I want them to be very, I want the, the composition to be very beautiful and very wearable, because that's one of the things, you know, uh, in the case of oud oils, you know, if you use it, you can use it for meditation, you can use it for uh, re relaxation. But when you're using a perfume, you got to remember that it's not just you who's going to be smelling this. It's going to be the people around you. It could be the office, the subway, uh, uh, your, your partner at home, and so on. And so that perfume has to be wearable. And I think one of the things that people don't realize is that oud, done right, is in fact also very, very wearable. So why perfume sprays now? Simple, to introduce the world to my oud oils. So here's the deal. All of my in-house oud distillations, they're all small batches. And one of the things which you got to remember is that just like uh, the case of humans, you know, if we ignore uh, the phenomenon of doppelgangers, the general rule is that no two batches of oud are identical. And what I like to do is whenever I'm making a perfume, I want the oud to be the actual star of the show. And so I'll use an oud with naturally um, for, for instance, uh, it naturally has intrinsic notes of, uh, for example, leather. And, you know, this is something that's going to be uh, suitable for either a, an Arabian genre perfume or, for instance, a chypre, for example. Or if I want, uh, if I want to make a fougé or perhaps something a little bit more Western, a little bit brighter, I would use something... Uh, for example, an Indonesian oud, uh, which has naturally bright, leafy, ethereal qualities. And so, when I am making a perfume, you know, I don't select the oud based on the perfume idea. Rather, I see what oud I have, and then what kind of perfume I can make with that. And since each batch is limited, I mean, these are handmade uh, oud distillations uh, and, and you know they're distilled from very very rare 
small batches of wood. So that's basically the limiting factor. And I wish I could triple, quadruple, pentuple the batch sizes, but sadly that's not the case. Okay, yeah, so one of the things I'm very excited about is um, I plan to start Agar Aura's own distillations of a variety of different uh, raw materials. So there's quite a few fragrant things that I've come across in the jungles here. Uh, there are certain varieties of, um, they call it kamiyan here. Um, it's not quite frankincense, but it possesses an aroma which is very much like frankincense. Likewise, they have a kind of chindana here. Uh, it's, they, they call it sandalwood. It's not actually sandalwood, but again, it's, uh, it's a very fragrant wood, which uh, I've seen here in Malaysia. And likewise, you know, during my jungle treks, uh, when I'm out looking for oud, uh, I have come across quite a few different species. So, like I said, uh, I plan to start uh, distilling not just the oud, uh, which is part of our uh, compositions, but also the other raw materials as well. And along with that, um, I've already started um, tincturing and making extracts as well. And of course, you know, right now this is time for the first collection. But one of the things which I'm very excited to introduce to everyone is um, the different genres uh, from around the world. So for instance, you know, a lot of people uh, don't know that the vintage medieval Arabian genre of perfumery, it's very, very different actually from uh, what it is today. So today's Arabian perfumery is for the most part actually Indian perfumery. Vintage, or sorry, uh, medieval Arabian perfumery was very different. And uh, several years ago, I made uh, an attar called Ghalia uh, al-Muluk, which literally means the, the precious perfume of the kings. And with this one was, uh, I, I followed a recipe uh, for a ghalia, which was, uh, you know, one of the popular types of uh, perfumes that was made uh, in Arabia back then. And this particular formula, it was for either uh, the Caliph Harun al-Rashid or Ma'mun al-Rashid. So this is circa, I think, around 800 CE, something like this. So that's a genre which I think um, the world at large is mostly unaware of. Then, of course, there is uh, more modern Arabian perfumery. I've done that as well. I've done I've done quite a few French genre uh, attars in the past as well, fougés and chivres in included. Uh, perhaps one of the most unusual for the Western aesthetic would be Japanese. And uh, in reality, Japanese. You know, the Japanese culture, actually, they, they don't have perfumery as part of their tradition. In fact, uh, what they do is they use this thing called zuko. It's, uh, it's body powder. So primarily it's uh, borneol, uh, so borneo camphor, sandalwood, and then a combination of different uh, powdered spices and herbs. And literally they paint that on their body. So zuko uh, from the Japanese culture. Uh, I've done some of those. In my first collection, it's kind of sort of a Zuko, Zuko type of uh, one of the perfumes. It's kind of like that, uh, but it's more so more of a, a, a temple vibe combined with uh, the aroma of oud and sandalwood incense as well. And, and it has a facet of Zuko as well. So let's see, there's again, there's a medieval Arabian, there's modern day Arabian slash Indian. Uh, Japanese and Japanese usually primarily I, I focus on Japanese incense and finally um, and this is kind of my favorite uh, category it's it's something eclectic it's something which doesn't really fall into any category and this would include some of my own creations uh, like blue or aquatica it doesn't fall under any uh, said category uh, of perfumes so speaking of this eclectic genre, um, like I said, this is my own brainchild. It doesn't really fall into any category. And here, I think it's worth mentioning that um, I'm kind of artsy fartsy in a, f in a few different things. So, you know, the culinary arts, um, I taught myself 
Sargam Sur Antal of the Indian, uh, Indian classical music as well, which is a little bit like jazz. And likewise, uh, three maqamat of uh, Quranic recitation, which also, it's a, um, not quite jazz, but uh, essentially it's, it's something which you cannot really categorize neatly. So for instance, you know, uh, in Western perfumery, you have these very rigid uh, structures, these genres within uh, perfumery. Uh, whereas um, with these eclectic blends that I make, it's a little bit more like, as I mentioned, you know, like uh, in the case of Indian music, for example, you know, you can actually stretch things, and you can you can you can play around with the with the tempo and so on, and it actually works. It actually works. So yeah, you know, uh, music, uh, painting. Uh, I won first place at the national level for oil painting when I was in grade nine. This painting behind me, actually, this was, uh, I, I made this as well. So yeah, art is something which I'm very passionate about and I'm very excited about being able to express myself in perfumery as well. So whether it's singing, whether it's the maqamat, whether it's painting, and in this case, perfumery. Uh, so this is what I want to share with you. Um, if I was to summarize what agar aura perfumes are, what the philosophy is, it is quality and beauty, and most importantly, brain zapping ouds, which is the base of these perfumes. So stay tuned. Uh, the first collection is going to be released very soon, and uh, I'm going to be rolling out quite a few genres, Arabian, uh, French, Japanese, and I hope that this art of mine that I'm creating, I hope you will enjoy it.